Welcome to the State of the Nation. I'm your host, Michael Sham, and joining me today is the Democratic Alliance Shadow Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, COGTA, Siliers Brink. Welcome to the State of the Nation, Siliers. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you, you know, I've been following you. You've uh, you've obviously been quite outspoken, quite uh, influential, and uh, I just thought we'd uh, have a catch-up. Uh, it's nice to see you up here in Joburg, and uh, welcome to our studio here in Parkhurst. And I uh, just want to dive into uh, all things about the State of the Nation, which obviously happens uh, soon, and we'll hear um, the other State of the Nation as delivered by our President uh, Soro Ramaphosa. But let's just start off with the VA. You recently had quite a popular, quite a a telling victory in the courts, didn't you? Um, where you got uh, the court to agree with you that the ANC needs to give records of their cater deployment meetings. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that has been a problem for quite a while. So we know that cater deployment is broadly speaking unconstitutional, unlawful. We have a case before the court where we actually want a declaratory order to that effect. But Zondo agrees and, and you know, common sense dictates that uh, if the ANC is deploying its agents in entities of the state and potentially even the judiciary, then that's a serious risk. And if we can expose it, we might get to the bottom of why certain things just aren't working. So the challenge at the outset was, how do you prove it? Because the ANC have said, 1997 Mafeking, King, their conference, they've got a policy, it's clearly articulated. They want control over the levers of power and they list them, public services, army and so forth. But even that doesn't give you evidence of actual cater deployment, actual uh, positions being manipulated, interviews being, uh, uh, you know, abridged. Uh, and the challenge was get the minutes because the minutes can be compared to actual outcomes. And if you can get the minutes, you might be able, if not retrospectively, prospectively stop instances from cater deployment happening, reverse certain disastrous appointments. Yeah. And uh, but of course, somebody and, and the ANC are going to argue, they're going to argue that every ruling party in any district has people that they like to work with. We see it all the time in American politics, right? When the Republicans come in and then, you know, they're appointing certain people to uh, key positions. Then when they get voted out and the Democrats get in, they reverse some of those appointments. Why is this different? So you, in any administration, any government, you get certain political appointees. You get certain folks, usually those that support a minister or a president in his office, a spokesperson, a speechwriter, and so on, uh, that are linked to the term of the office holder. They are very political. They are in the public service, but they're sort of political support staff. But the majority of folks who work for government are meant to be professionals. They are meant to be there, whoever is in power. And it's not just common practice the, the world over. I mean, Donald Trump can do what he likes. Joe Biden can reverse appointments that he likes, but he's not going to change the engineers. He's not going to change the folks who do the technical work of government. The backbone of that is what a competent, uh, capable state is made of. And if we reverse that, you see the results that we're seeing in this country. You see a breakdown of the capacity of the state to deliver services you see a deterioration in the ability of the state to play any developmental role. So that is really a bogus argument to say that all political parties uh, uh, deploy their cadres. And if the ANC wants to uh, compare themselves to the National Party and to the Bruderbund, well, that's their standard. But we now have a constitutional standard. Section 197 of the Constitution says that your uh, civil service needs to be apolitical and independent. If you look at municipal law, it says that a municipal manager, for example, can't promote or prejudice the interests of a political party. It is crucially important if we are going to survive the demise of the ANC, which I think is, is it's on the cards, we are going to have to separate the apparatus of the state, the civil service, from the ANC. And, and that's why this is such an important uh, fight for us, especially our our champion of the cause, Dr. Leon Schreiber. Yeah, and uh, and and uh, but obviously this is going to be a process that will run because the ANC have already indicated that they're going to appeal. Yeah, uh, this is going to be an ongoing process that will probably get resolved after the election. Yeah, but it is a victory for now. It is a victory, and 
if we cast our minds back to the Zondo Commission, Cyril Ramaphosa explicitly defended cater deployment. Mm -hmm. He said, we, he, he didn't say there's no cater deployment. He says, we need cater deployment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he turns around, or cabinet turns around, they said, oh, no, you know, cater deployment won't happen. Well, if that is the position, just concede to the DA's application, concede in the, in the Gauteng High Court, have it declared unlawful, unconstitutional in line with Zondo, but they're not doing that. They're fighting it, which shows that they haven't abandoned cater deployment. The second point is, you know, even though the body of the ANC might uh, be dying, uh, its spirit might inhibit some other political party. You know, we've seen the chaos with coalitions and, and you know, general uncertainty at the end of one party dominance in this country. It is plausible that some other political party who's not the ANC might come into a position of authority in future and want to play ANC politics, want to deploy their own cadres. Uh, and then it's important that we have the rules, we have the precedent, we say, no, this is not South Africa's constitutional standard. Yeah, and uh, these things are best uh, tackled relatively early in a country's democracy. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a fascinating story, which we won't go into all the details, of uh, Greece's demise, hmm. which was started with something, uh, you know, a hundred years before, where one party promised to replace all the civil servants with uh, their party supporters. And, and that never ended. It that never just ended, continued. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Until uh, they made some really bad laws to try and stop people from doing it. But uh, moving forward, you mentioned, um, and, and obviously very hot in, on, in topic of discussion at the moment, is the fact that the ANC seems to be losing support. By all accounts, they certainly going to get less than 50% in the next election by, by, by all accounts, unless they suddenly find some mojo from somewhere. But uh, given that, it looks like they're going to be ruling at very least, the country will be ruled by coalitions. So I want to dive straight in because obviously a lot of people will be interested to know about coalitions because obviously we've just had uh, the debacle of what happened in, uh, in, up here in Gauteng with some of our metros. And um, the DA is sort of like everybody's favorite whipping boy for, uh, for coalition failure at the moment, right? And the DA's response to that is always, yes, but look how well we're doing in Cape Town, right? Which sort of doesn't help us as we navigate another thousand potholes in Johannesburg. Tell us uh, about coalitions. Are they ever going to work? So I think the important point is, despite what happened in Joburg, despite what is happening in Ekuruleni and in other places where coalitions are unstable and unreliable and open to being sabotaged by the ANC, there is about 36 coalitions in the country where the DA has a part. Uh, and the vast majority of those are, in fact, successful. Now, you could say it's the small towns, you know, it's yeah. places where the DA is already strong, where there's already a you know, a, a tradition of, of, of good governance and so on. But it, we can't just write off coalitions. We have to learn what are the best conditions for coalitions to succeed. And that is, I can summarize it, two points. You need, and, and this is coalitions or ordinary government, you need at least 50% plus one majority in the municipal council or in the legislature. Without that, in a municipality, for example, you can't appoint a municipal manager. You can't approve a budget. You can't raise a loan to fix the crumbling infrastructure of Joburg. You can't get rid of an incompetent ma uh, city manager or a senior official. Mm. So you sort of, you're a lame duck government in office, but not in power. The second important thing is if you have that 50 uh, plus one, 50 percent plus one majority, is you have to have some sort of a unity of purpose and a shared agenda in your government. Uh, because you can have 50% plus one, but if you are fighting with each other over jobs or over serious principles, you are going to be just as useless as the ANC, and the bigger risk is possibly even more useless. So, so that unity of purpose is important. You don't have to agree about everything. You don't, in fact, have to like each other, but you have to agree about the big stuff. And if I can just say something about uh, uh, Joe Burke, um, Mike, the 2021 local government election in Joburg weakened the ANC. And that's a good thing. It, it weakened them even further than uh, 2016. But it also weakened the DA. And it left the opposition vote 
scattered. If you look at the results of the election, 19 political parties in Joburg's municipal council. The biggest political parties got 33% of the vote, roughly a third of the vote, the ANC. And the groupings of political parties, if you have to say likely coalitions, the ANC grouping was bigger from the outset. 51% if you include the Patriotic Alliance and the EFF in the ANC grouping based on the record of supporting the ANC in the past. Mpo Palazzi was elected in 2021, not because the DA grouping was bigger, we were smaller, 40, 40, roughly 49%, but because the EFF voted for the DA candidate. And they did so in all of the metros, uh, probably to buy time so that they could later uh, get a better deal with the ANC, which they did ex exactly the same game plan as, as in 2016. So we had a choice. Do we make a deal with the EFF? We were under considerable pressure by Action SA in particular to do a deal with the EFF to sort of consummate that relationship after they had voted for our uh, mayoral candidate. We rejected that, as did many, most of our coalition partners. Um, the Patriotic Alliance was then the only other option, about 2.9% of the seats in the council. And several sincere attempts were made. Eventually, in February last year, February uh, 2022, we got a deal. We brought the Patriotic Alliance in. Unfortunately, as events have proved, uh, the coalition agreement was not worth the paper it was written on. So even though we had that 50% plus one, we didn't have a unity of purpose, and it's become clear that the Patriotic Alliance uh, is simply not in government to, to serve any sort of program of action. Our values are irreconcilable. Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it brings us back to, to those two basics of, of what makes a successful coalition. Yeah. Now, I mean, the Patriotic Alliance um, have, have done exactly what they said they were going to do. They were available yes. to the highest bidder. Uh, Gayton McKenzie said that after straight after the 2019 election. He said he's only in it for the best um, financial deal. Has he so, accepted your offer to come here, by the way? He has accepted, then he's uh, de delayed, delayed, and I'm still dying. Kate McKenzie or any of your supporters, if you see this, please answer my calls. Come on the show. You said you would, and it would, I'd love to hear what he has to say. But in essence, uh, yeah, you know, he, he's doing exactly as advertised on the box, he said he was there to uh, get the best financial deal for himself and his party, and yeah, he's done it. And uh, now he's in bed quite clearly with the ANC and the EFF. And that looks like now it's going to carry to the next election. So everyone looks forward. I was uh, talking about this just recently. It looks like certain certain stars may have aligned because of some of the movements really. Really, the the whole sort of uh, Gauteng metro situation has shown the hand of the EFF that it wants to be with the ANC, but it wants to be in charge of the ANC, which is not that difficult because the ANC seem to have no leadership whatsoever. Um, so it it looks like uh, what's lining up in the next election is an ANC EFF and now Patriotic Alliance because those are the only people that will deal with him with him now. On the one hand, and uh, it looks to me like quite a big thing, which seems to have gotten a little bit under the radar, and that was uh, what the EFF had to do and say towards the IFP in KZN. Hmm. I found it quite bizarre, where they seem to have quite a cozy relationship, where, to those that don't know, um, the IFP were, were um, the majority party, but or, or the biggest party, but not the majority in a number of KZN municipalities. They went into a coalition agreement with the EFF and gave them a whole lot of uh, control positions, mayor mayoralties, etc. And then uh, out of the blue, the EFF started to call the IFP, uh, well, Julius Malema started to call the IFP apartheid collaborators, blah, 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 and voted against them in, mm. in KZN. And now that cozy relationship has seems to have thrown the IFP into the camp oh. of the DA. Well, I, I think so. what triggered that is the IFP standing by uh, the coalition in Joburg and voting from Bopalatse instead of uh, joining that uh, that ANC grouping. So I think that that is what uh, what what made the dominoes fall. Yeah. But certainly, as we head towards the new the the, the general election in twenty twenty four. It looks quite clearly that uh, the three major parties on on your 
coalition ticket, as it were, is going to be yourselves, uh, the IFP, Freedom Front Plus, uh, Action SA, um, yeah. those so, parties. So those uh, relationships are really important to us. And, uh, you know, we've got bumps and we've got difficulties and differences of personality. But we really have to make things work there where we can. For instance, in the city of Tswane, where that coalition has a 50% plus one majority, unlike Joburg and Ekurumene. But let me just make a comment about the EFF now finally entering a coalition of the ANC. One thing that we shouldn't forget is that a collaboration with the ANC is probably very unpopular among EFF supporters. If you look at the propaganda, the messaging of the EFF to the voters in 2019, 2021, they are probably the most anti-ANC antagonistic party. Their whole message is to disrupt the ANC, to disrupt the existing order. So an important question is going to be, how will EFF voters respond to the fact that the EFF have now uh, collaborated to bring the ANC back to power in Joburg. And I think that's why you're sitting with uh, a, a stooge in the seat of the mayor. I think that's part of trying to deflect attention that what the, a the EFF did in Joburg was to bring the ANC back to power. And there will be a reckoning for that. Uh, you'd think that you know, EFF folks would be close to the, ANC, uh, to the ANC because the EFF is effectively a faction of the ANC. Their policies are, are in many ways similar. But the voters don't vote based on ideology. The same is true of the Patriotic Alliance. If you ask the people of Aldo's, of Westbury, of Rivoli, did you vote for the Patriotic Alliance so that they can bring the ANC back to power? The answer is probably going to be no. So there will be an electoral reckoning. Uh, based on what happened in Joburg. Uh, and obviously, that, that, the essence of that is that the news isn't just all bad. Uh, and, and, you know, what happened in Joburg is not fated for the rest of the country, necessarily. Let's move away from this and let's start looking at South Africa as a whole. Because, um, you know, there's a bigger question. While uh, the politicians politic and uh, while... Soro Ramaphosa vacillates on everything. The country is busy going to hell at the moment. Uh, it's very hard to, to, to get a defender of uh, the route that the country is currently, or the trajectory that the country is currently on. We've got this terrible power situation, which is, seems to have finally alerted people in the ANC, and I presume that's largely because they're losing support, that there is a crisis. So let's first deal with, elect with electricity and ESCOM. The state of disaster as mooted by the president, right, which seemed to emanate quite largely from the DA, mm. right? Is this such a good idea to give um, Suru Ramaphosa and Gwedi Mantashi uh, the ability to ride roughshod over any kind of oversight? Cert yeah, certainly not. Any arrangement, any attempt to abridge existing laws that just gives a blank check to Mantashe or Dlamini Zuma is absolutely unacceptable. But then why? But at the same at the same time, you have to admit that the situation at ESCOM is a disaster. It is a man-made disaster. It's a government-made disaster, but it is a disaster nonetheless. Now, what Andre de Reiter and many other people in the energy sector have pointed out is that in order to stabilize ESCOM, you are going to have to abridge, if not reform and abolish, certain laws that stand in the way of dealing with the disaster as it is. Preferential procurement, black economic empowerment, uh, even race-based recruitment laws, narrow the market of skills, products, and services available to a sincere management at ESCOM who is trying to uh, remedy the situation, and we'll have to see who succeeds Andre de Reiter at ESCOM. But you have to find a way to abridge those things. Otherwise, you're not going to get the burning platform that is ESCOM under control. And yes, we've got to reduce our reliance on ESCOM, but that's medium to long term. In the short term, ESCOM is what we have, and you really need to stabilize the situation there. So what the DA proposed was a ring-fenced uh, approach, a ring-fenced state of disaster, for the sole reason that that would allow you to abridge these laws that stand in the way of getting things done and getting them done quickly. 
but that does not mean a blanket state of disaster. That's a, it's a very different creature. Uh, and, uh, you know, to say now that uh, this idea comes from the DA and just give all the power to Dlamini Zuma, that's rubbish. Uh, if you don't do a state of disaster, you'll have to do some other thing to abridge those laws. You have to strike them off the, the statute books, uh, but that's going to be a long-term process, whereas we need to keep the lights on in the short and medium term. Otherwise, there is no long term. Yeah, it just is a terrifying prospect of, uh, you know, COVID uh, come back again where, where mm. there's a blank check. There's no oversight. Yeah. There's no uh, repercussion. And at the end of it all, it's going to carry um, the DA's name to it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think it's it's disingenuous to say that the DA suggested giving a blank check. As I, you know, as I said, what we proposed is a ring fenced response to the situation. Um, but yeah, I mean, Cyril Ramaphosa has within his power to appoint the Minister for Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. Uh, the current incumbent is one that stabbed him in the back last year. I mean, you have some admiration for what she did in voting for the committee to look into his uh, impeachment. Uh, she should probably have known that there would have been repercussions to that. But be that as it may, he is, it is within his power as the president to appoint somebody that he can uh, trust in that position. It's also within his power to uh, announce a set of measures in this uh, state of the nation that will allow ESCOM and the situation with the country's energy supply to be stabilized. Uh, and, and I don't think saying, you know, give a blank check is the answer or, or that's what anyone says uh, what the country needs. So um, now let's turn our attention then to Parliament, which is obviously meant to hold people to account and, and, and doesn't. Uh, let's start off with the fact that uh, the parliamentary buildings burned down mm. you know, more than a year ago and seemingly nothing has been done. Yeah. Uh, to either uh, repair the place or actually proceed with any kind of uh, um, um, uh, legal action. Mm. What's happening to Parliament? I mean, is, uh, Parliament, it, it, this seems to me it suits Sir Ramaphosa down to the ground, isn't it? You've got an absent Parliament, which is exactly what he wants. He, he won't give an interview. He won't even speak to any to the country, right? Um Surely, uh, is there any plans to ever get Parliament back to operation or is that mm. not going to happen? Well, let me just say that the fact that Parliament hasn't been rebuilt does affect the prestige of the institution. So it, it definitely has an effect. You can't have in-person meetings. Your committees are all online. And as convenient as these online meetings are, they're just not as effective at eyeballing officials and ministers and, and getting the truth uh, you know, about what's happening, uh, applying that pressure in an effective way. But I wouldn't say that Parliament is completely absent or hasn't been used at all. Uh, I think that the process that uh, started against Ramaphosa over Palapala, the impeachment process, unprecedented, uh, maybe with the exception of the Zuma uh, attempt, uh, really does show that despite all of these things, Parliament can still be an effective vehicle for holding the executive to account. Parliament can be used to limit the space that the president has and to send him in a particular direction. Obviously, what we want is a majority in parliament. That's, that's how you govern a country. But while we are in opposition, uh, we'll use parliament as effectively as possible. And, and I think that uh, folks will see that the DA is really I mean, we're asking the questions. We're using every technique. Uh, we're making that institution a very difficult place for an un unaccountable government. Uh, to be at. But um, we are obviously extremely disappointed in the fact that, that almost no attempt has been made to inform the public about the progress of rebuilding uh, the, the National Assembly. Um, you know, somebody said if the private sector were responsible for that construction project, it would have been halfway done already. Yeah. If it was a casino, it would have been built already, right? There's no <laughs> yeah. doubt about it. Yes. Yeah. That's an idea. Maybe you should start a parliamentary casino. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the outcomes couldn't be a hell of a lot worse than what we've got to. Yeah. But uh, as the shadow minister of uh, COGTA, um, do you have any say? Is there any influence? Has there been any effort made to rebuild the National Assembly? So we as opposition parties, our chief whip, Sivir Guajube, keep on asking about when are we going to return to Parliament? 
Uh, our argument is that there, if you use the existing facilities at Parliament, you'll probably able, be able to host most of the committee meetings in person. So we must also be careful of this argument until Parliament is rebuilt. You know, mm. we shouldn't come back to a physical space. I think Cape Town has got more than enough facilities, but there is a, a reluctance to do it. Uh, and the only thing we can do in the meantime is to use the existing institutions and to keep on asking, what is the plan uh, to have Parliament rebuilt? Where will the money come from? You'll have to budget it. So the first uh, indication that there's a serious attempt to fix the National Assembly, to restore the chamber, would be an indication of the budget, which will follow the, the state of the nation. Because uh, government, uh, as it is, there's no, there's no real insurance policy that government has. Go most of government's risk is funded out of the fiscus itself. But yet we've got money to potentially uh, sponsor an international football team. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that because of the pressure that, that we and civil society has applied, the president has now said, this is a ridiculous idea. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's a very good chance that that, that will be prevented from happening. And um, that's an upside of what we have. So there's many institutions that don't work in this country. A lot of reason to be pessimistic. But as somebody who's in politics, an uh, organization that's committed to make this country work, we can't write off everything. We must use the little that we have optimally. And I think the benefit in South Africa is we're an independent media. We're a very active uh, uh, civil society. Uh, we have a political opposition who knows how to use the, the mechanisms of parliament and so forth to hold the government to account. So, um, you know, maybe the ANC is, is uh, running out of, uh, of uh, the leeway to, to do things like this. Now, you know, I think to many people that are watching this, they may have forgotten that there was a time before every action had to be run to court to get the government to do mm -hmm. some work, right? Mm. Uh, there's a thing called parliament and sometimes you can, even the government gets persuaded or is meant to, do you think we're ever going to return to days where where Parliament actually starts uh, and our politicians actually run the country for good? Do you see them being? Uh, do you see that on the horizon, or do you think that's an era long gone? Well, listen, the ANC's disrespect for Parliament is uh, a function of the party that has dominated electoral politics for twenty eight years, twenty seven years. Uh, the the ANC has been the master of all its surveys. Uh, and so it didn't have to compromise. The compromises that it did make were uh, on peripheral issues or because of the personality of the decision maker. Nelson Mandela, for example, was far more uh, open to talking to the opposition. But even he did not make fundamental compromises because the power, the balance of power, didn't require the ANC to do so. So we are now reaching the end of ANC one-party dominance. We've seen it in the local government elections where the ANC lost, uh, dipped below 50% of the vote. So whoever sits in positions of authority, executive, parliament, after 2024, Mike, in all likelihood, will need to learn very quickly how to compromise. Uh, if that is not done, then we'll have a chaotic situation. You'll have, you'll have the National Assembly being run like the Joburg City Council. Uh, and that's really what you don't want. So... Short answer to your question, it's going to change. Uh, but the complication is unless we find a way to stabilize the politics, uh, unless we can make coalitions, put coalitions on a, on a stable footing, then you're going to have potentially a chaotic situation. And I don't want to uh, go further than the question that you asked, but I think an important part of that is to reform our electoral laws. We've got a system of proportional representation in this country. And in 94, 96, when the National Party and the ANC were negotiating the Constitution, nobody thought that proportional representation would be your mechanism of power sharing, uh, you know, in the future. And that's why nobody thought of putting in what most systems of proportional representation has, and that is a threshold mm. of representation. In Germany, it's 5%. Uh, in other countries, 1% or 2%. Between 1% or 2% will probably be best for this country because it will eliminate that breaking up of the vote that causes the chaos that you see in Joburg and other 
uh, coalition uh, setups. So that has to be a really important part. And I never thought we're going to have this conversation. I mean, 10 years ago, uh, when I was young, uh, relatively young in politics, uh, city council in Tswane, I, I never really thought that we'd be at this point so soon talking about the demise of the ANC. Yeah. And uh, for, for, for the people that don't understand what the threshold means, it means that those sort of uh, one-seat um, um, parties mm. don't get a seat at the table when, when it comes to uh, things like coalitions. Yeah, I mean, it basically means that unless your party can get at least 1% or 2% of the vote, then you don't have uh, representation uh, in Parliament. Yeah. And, and that, that will take Joburg's 19 political parties probably down to nine. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you look at the situation. Yeah. Now, let's, let's look ahead. Let's look ahead. We're talking about um, a decline of the ANC, which has happened a lot faster than many people have, uh, have anticipated. The other part that hasn't really appeared, often when you see parties lose power from a seemingly unassailable position, is being the rise of a movement or the rise of a party or the rise of an individual leading a popular movement. That's not really happened. In South Africa, has manifested more of ANC supporters staying away from the polls. Mm. They haven't indicated yet that they're prepared to vote for anybody else, but they, they're not happy to vote for the ANC. Um, I've debated that with a whole lot of people, and we get a whole lot of different um, uh, views on this. In my opinion, quite simply, it's a decent step to at least getting people to stop voting for the ANC. But here we go into an election where by all accounts, the ANC looks like it's going to poll lower than 50. But you do have a realistic um, situation where the DA may not grow its its support base. May not. It didn't in the last government election. The question is, what is the DA doing wrong? So let me just say, uh, if you look at opinion polls, not just our own, but the ANCs that were published in City Press and Rapport at the weekend, they show not only a decline for the ANC, they show significant growth for the DA. Now, you could say uh, that's not you know, under the pressure of an election. Once yeah. the ANC starts handing out food parcels and, and, and doing the more legitimate things that a political party does in the run-up to the election, uh, the ANC might recover slightly and the DA might decline slightly. But the point is, it's significant that the DA has never been as high in opinion polls as it is now. And I think it's important to note, it is because the DA finally has a coherence, a policy coherence, a unity, uh, a sense of shared purpose that we might have lacked before. We are very realistic about change in the South African context. We are not going to win over the majority of ANC voters in one or two or three electoral cycles you are happy with incremental growth. And our bet is that as South Africans learn, as new things happen, as all of the old assumptions of the past of one party ANC rule crumble, and you're looking at the prospect. If this country can't pay social grants, it changes the entire social reality that you have. All political bets are off, all assumptions of the past are off. It's dangerous, but it's also inevitable uh, that, that these changes will happen. So it, it doesn't help for the DA to try and turn ourselves into a movement that we aren't. No, we, we aren't going to be a better version of the ANC. Uh, and if we try that, we end up being a worse version of ourselves. The voters don't buy it. Uh, um, you know, the majority of the black electorate who we need to draw towards the DA in order to become a majority party in, in, in years to come won't buy it either. We have to be genuine. We have to stick to our principles and we have to convince South Africa as things fall apart under ANC rule that uh, perhaps a different alternative approach, a different worldview, a different set of principles are important. We have to stand our ground. And you're quite right. The pattern of change in this country is that voters stop voting uh, for the ANC. Um, and that's something. We've got to make the most of that. Uh, but we've also seen, if you look at the Western Cape, for example, where once upon a time, the ANC, with the help of, of the National Party, was quite dominant. 
uh, in that province, many ANC supporters, many people who didn't consider voting DA, switched over to the DA as things changed, as new realities emerged. So I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. But the DA can only take responsibility for the integrity of our offer. Yeah, it does uh, feel a little bit uh, silly as like we're using, uh, I mean, you know, lies, lies and uh, statistics. But, you know, the Western Cape has got, has got different demographics mm. for the rest of the country. And one, you know, must, must really question how much of, uh, of the experience in the Western Cape is applicable to the rest mm. of the country. You know, here in South Africa, there are some realities. And the reality is, I suppose the question has been raised, does the DA harbor any sort of uh, desire to become the ruling party in South Africa? Because it doesn't, it doesn't look like enough is being taken into account in terms of what turns voters on. Connecting with voters is, I suppose, the, uh, the term. The, the DA is, absolutely has the ambition to govern this country. Uh, but what is of the utmost importance is that we don't destroy ourselves in an attempt to do so. So the formula that many political commentators uh, give us is, has been for many years, turn yourself into a better version of the ANC. Because voters have continually supported the ANC, they want more of a, a African nationalist or even more of a social democratic party. Make yourself into something like the ANC that's not corrupt. And that might be the key to change. We cannot do that. We can't do that. Because unless we do things differently in government, we end up, we're going to end up repeating all of the mistakes of the ANC only under uh, a DA brand. Same ANC policies that have failed, the same poor assumptions uh, about what's needed for South Africa, only wrapped in blue. And that's something we can't be. So we can't control the rate at which South Africans switch to the DA and the liberal democratic alternative that we offer. We can only try and be as true to ourselves as possible while trying to overcome some of these cultural barriers that do exist. And we have to acknowledge them. I mean, there are certain cultural barriers, but we are the party that believes in shared principles, regardless of race and culture and group. We have to be that party. Once we abandon that, the DA, I mean, the DA is not worth anything. Uh, I think we have seen the growth of some pretty remarkable leaders from all communities in the DA. And not because, uh, I mean, they were pushed or because some committee of elders decided, you know, these are the folks that must take up the positions, but because they were the best. They were the best for the positions. So... You look now at our leadership, Sibiu Guahube, Chief Whip in Parliament, an excellent legislature, the best possible person to take that position. Salim Malatsi, who is with me, a national spokesperson of the party. Salim Samanga, the provincial leader in Gauteng. And I can go on. The DA has the, the talent, the diversity to communicate our message across these divisions of race and culture. Um, but unfortunately, we cannot exactly determine how quickly South Africans will take up that offer. Well, Salia's Brink, let's hope that people take up your offer as we head towards the election. Um, and there's going to be a lot of ground to cover between now and then. We wish you the very best. Thank you so much for coming into the studio here in Parkhurst. And uh, thank you so much and best of luck uh, to, to, for your political future. To everybody that's watched it, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for joining us on the State of the Nation, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.